you, our online guests and everybody, panelists, uh, keynote speakers, everybody, welcome to uh, this edition of the Conversation Africa uh, Dialogue. Indeed, this is the second in the series in recent times. Um, the uh, conversation or the dialogue is on the theme Universal Health Coverage in Ghana, Gaps and Opportunity. Universal Health Coverage in Ghana has been a major, major issue in the past two decades or a decade and a half. Ghana is uh, one of those shining examples, at least um, when it comes to the issue of health finance in Ghana, uh, national health insurance scheme, etc., and the kind of work Ghana has been doing uh, in that space on the continent. So uh, we think it is quite opportune to have this discussion at this time to see what Ghana is, is doing right, what Ghana can improve upon, and, and what Ghana should stop doing in order to speed up its march to uh, universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is a key theme all across the world, and indeed it's been captured uh, in the uh, Sustainable Development Goal, specifically uh, Goal 3.8, where it takes time to detail out what it expects of you know, countries in terms of universal health coverage. Uh, this is a two-hour session. Uh, we have a very uh, distinguished panel which will be helping us discuss the matters. It is expected that by the end of today's session, uh, we would have understood where Ghana stands uh, in universal health coverage, what gaps and opportunities exist uh, in, in the country's march towards UHC and, and, and a whole lot of things. I will in due course introduce the panel and introduce um, a very important personality now, Ms. who is the presidential advisor on health in Ghana. He'll give an introductory remark and, and I believe a lot of the discussion will flow from um, what he really has to say. In the meantime, um, we we'll want to um, hear a word from the conversation Africa, the team putting this together. I must also mention that this has been done in a partnership with the University of Ghana, Legon. My name is Salom Aduni. So on this note, I welcome, uh, or I call on Adejuan Soinka, who is a Conversation Africa, uh, West Africa regional editor, uh, to welcome us and to tell us a bit about the Conversation Africa and why this dialogue at this particular time. So. Um, Adejuan, uh, you may take it away. Thank you, Salam, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Warm welcome to everybody on the line, uh, those on the Zoom call and those who are, who are, who are following us um, on Facebook Live. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, as Salam already told you, my name is Adeju Shunika. I'm the West Africa Regional Editor at the Conversation Africa. I'm based in Lagos, Nigeria, from where... I lead our West Africa team with operations in Accra, Ghana, and Dakar, Senegal. Um, also in the room are my colleagues who are spread across the continent in Johannesburg to start with, in South Africa, which is where our head office is. Um, we've got colleagues from Nairobi, Kenya, where East Africa Regional Editor is based, as well as, of course, Ghana, and um, colleagues from Senegal, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, but that's not, uh, that's not all. Um, the Conversation Africa belongs to a network of um, global media, uh, the TC, uh, the Conversation Across the World. And so we have our colleagues in the UK, our colleagues in Australia, uh, in the United States, in Canada, France, Spain, New Zealand, Indonesia, uh, just to mention some of the places where we have our practitioners spread across the world. Uh, again, a warm welcome to the University of Ghana who are our academic partner for this dialogue today. I must also especially welcome our speakers and panelists, um, starting, of course, with the health advisor to the president of Ghana, Professor Asari, who has joined us this morning, um, uh, and also will be delivering the opening address today. And, of course, our other esteemed panel speakers, Dr. Patience Asikabo, Dr. Apeka Nkuma, and Dr. Anthony Danso Ape, all of whom you will all meet and engage with us and proceed with the program this morning. Thank you all for honoring our invitation and for being here today. And in fact, promptly too. Thank you very much. Now, the conversation for those, the conversation Africa for those of you who may not uh, be already familiar with what we do is a news and analysis based organization. We work with academics and scientists. We help them to translate and publish their research and insight into everyday language that will be shareable 
and will be a platform where they can share insights of their research with the rest of the world and the public as well. Our website is um, freely accessible. I encourage those of us who are not yet following the website to please do so um, immediately after this um, program. In fact, you can also subscribe to our daily newsletters and get these insights sent on your web, on your email on a daily basis. Uh, our work and our mission is to increase the visibility of African scientists and to make sure that the world of knowledge and research that often remains only within university corridors and, of course, complex peer-to-peer -peer journals is in the hands of the public and also the policy makers, the policy community who can make use of this important insight and make better decisions that will uh, make life easier or make life better for, for, for our societies across the continent and across the world. Since we launched in 2015, the Conversation Africa has published over 4,700 scientists and researchers and their combined articles have been read over 90 million times from across the world, proving one major important factor, which is the fact that, look, our communities want to hear from experts. They want to hear from people who know exactly what they are talking about. And it also proves that uh, scientific voices really do matter in issues around the world. So uh, why do we uh, engage in policy dialogues of this nature as well? Really, it's an extension of our mission to bridge the gap between the academic world and, and policy makers and the rest of the society. So, so policy dialogues of this nature is a platform where we, we want scientists to be able to share their insights and, and be able to bring scientists into one room as well as policy makers and the general public and we get them to discuss an important uh, issue that affects, you know, affects people generally. For today, the discussion is focused on universal healthcare coverage. Um, yes, of course, we'll be focusing more on Ghana, but the topic we're discussing is actually important and relevant across the continent. You know, it's important that citizens have access to healthcare and that they have access not just to healthcare, but to quality healthcare. And this access is not something that should just be enjoyed by only the privileged few. It should be open to everybody. However, you know, as we all know from our experiences uh, in different parts of the continent, a lot of Africans and African countries are, you know, battling to, to achieve this on a daily basis. So it is my hope, and it's our hope as the Conversation of Africa, that the insights and the ideas that we shared here today will not only be useful for Ghana, but for other countries um, on the continent and for everybody who is on the line. Once again, thank you very much. I welcome you all for joining us this morning. And I look forward to a very robust um, dialogue between policymakers and the scientists as we proceed along uh, in the course of our program this morning. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Selim. I hand over to you. All right. So thank you so much, um, Adejuwon Soinka, who is. Uh, the regional director for the Conversation Africa, West Africa region. Thank you so much for that welcome and, and that brief talk on the Conversation Africa. Well, so we want to zoom straight into the event itself. Uh, we're privileged to have a very important personality in our midst. And uh, if you're in Ghana, you have heard him speak on many, many occasions. And now, you know, in this period of pandemic, he's is, is quite busy uh, 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 dealing with Ghana's COVID response amongst other things. So we are very pleased that he's made time to, to be with us today. It's in the person of Dr. Anthony uh, Nsia Sari, who is uh, the Presidential Advisor on Health. So um, Dr. Sari is a Ghanaian medical officer. He's an academic and health management expert. He has worked in the Ghanaian health sector for close to 40 years, served various management levels, and was also the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. Uh, he's a politician, so he's a member of the New Patriotic Party, and he currently advises the president of Ghana, His Excellency uh, Nanado Dankwe Kufuadu, on, on matters of health. I must say that in his, in his previous life, he has been the chief executive officer of the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, which is uh, 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 one of two major, major hospitals in, in, our, in our country. 
And, and he's done quite a number of things for himself. And, and now he's serving the country in yet another capacity. You know, there, there was something somebody told me some time back that uh, in a political system, there are two people who are very important. One, the one who has the ear of the candidate or the president. And number two, the one who has the money. So, so I think it is safe to say that Ogansia Sari, on matters of health, uh, has the ear of the president. So he's one of the key persons to deal with us. And I must also mention that by virtue of his position before as the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, he also sat on the board of the National Health Insurance Authority. So he's very well clothed to, to, to take us through uh, um, the, the subject and the discussion. So, um, uh, Dr. Ansia Sari, you, you are welcome to this program, and we are very pleased to have you. Thank you very much, Salom, and uh, good morning to all of you, especially those who are online listening to us virtually. I'm very grateful and very honored for the invitation that the Conversation Africa has given to me to at least open the topic that you have put up. It's a very important topic. It's a human, right, human rights issue. Health is the human rights issue. And uh, as for that matter, we in Ghana and the government of Ghana is very much committed to attaining the sustainable development goals. The principles of African Union Agenda 2063, we are also committed for attaining the Global Action Plan for Healthy Lives and Wellbeing, declaration of the primary health care in Astana 2018, and the UAC 2030 Compact initiatives of UAC 2020 and the political declaration of UAC adopted by the UN High Level Meeting in September 2019. This is at the heart of whatever we are doing is a human, as I said, principles of human rights, equity, gender, and people-centered approaches. I'm very happy that uh, the Conversation Africa has gathered together scientists, public health practitioners, and policy makers to take stock and analyze Ghana's public health system and our ability to ensure that we attain the universal health coverage. But you all agree with me that globally, uh, access to health globally has now become a problem because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has actually added tremendous pressure on resources. And Ghana has a very scarce resources in revealing gaps in public health systems in Ghana. In fact, COVID-19 has released the gaps for all of us to see. And for that matter, His Excellency, the President, have also taken the bull by the horn to make sure that at least we'll fill in the gap as quickly as possible. What have you done so far? What we've done is that um, despite COVID-19, we have put together a roadmap, and I'm sure you can get hold of the roadmap It's a policy roadmap, and what has to understand to a lot of uh, the national health policy, which was done. Um, Doc, if you can hear us, I, I, I think your line is breaking up a bit. Um, uh, you, may, you may have to, um, well, so, so I think we eventually lost him. Um, I think we will try and then uh, reconnect with him quickly so that he continues with his, uh, his, his submission. Uh, um, he was making a very important point on, on Garnet's uh, journey so far. And uh, he, he started by looking at uh, various uh, institutions and, and various uh, no, uh, Yes, I, I think it's 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 better. Yes. yes. So as I said, that Ghana. So I think you are at the point of the policy roadmap for you. Yes, the policy roadmap. Yeah. So we've come up with a, a policy roadmap for achieving universal health coverage. And our vision is that all people in Ghana have timely access to high quality health services, irrespective of ability to pay. 
at the point of K. And um, we have objectives. Our objective is universal access to better and efficient managed quality health services. We want to reduce unnecessary maternal and adolescent and child health and disabilities. We also want to increase access to responsive clinical and public health emergencies. And as you are aware, we have garden principles. We have five main garden principles for our roadmap. What you want to do is that you want to target scalable, high impact, high multiplier areas to deliver value. And uh, the actions should, these actions should catalyze into change and scale up our access to essential nutrition, health promotion, interventions, smart, creative care, disease prevention, palliative, rehabilitative, emergency care, and maternal health services. So it's a whole compact of services that you want to give. But we want to use the primary health care as a level of emphasis. emphasis. And systems would be put in place to enhance access to specialized care through referral system. The value proposition follows a five-point guiding principle. The first guiding principle is that we want to target. We want to focus on the poor and the vulnerable, particularly children and adolescents, women, and the age, aged. Two, we want to have a financial risk protection. We want to eliminate all physical and financial barriers to assessing primary health services, especially those most at risk of incurring adverse health expenditure on the incidence of health. We want to have a strategic partners. We want to build sustainable partnership and harmonize agenda between government, the private, the private sector, non-state actors, and development partners to upscale the services the service delivery and secure pre predictable financing for long-term results. The fourth uh, strategic guiding principle is to effective decentralized management. We want to cement uh, district-level services governance of district assemblies and improve intersectorial collaboration to synergize resource mobilization, efficient use and accountability, particularly in primary healthcare levels of service. And lastly, we want to also prioritize domestic financing to rationalize allocation and expenditure of the domestic resources to focus on primary healthcare and manage existing and any new co-financing requirements within a realistic budgetary allocation. So, so far, despite COVID-19, we've done a lot of things. First, we have strengthened our national health insurance or we are strengthening since 2017. And unfortunately, the COVID came in in 20, uh, 2020. We've been strengthening our national health insurance authority. We are increasing. Health insurance is supposed to be for everybody. And because now that we've introduced the Ghana card, once you have the Ghana card as an adult, about 15 years, uh, automatically you are supposed to be on health insurance. So that's what we are doing so that we increase the number of people who are active on health insurance. We have also done a lot of leadership and management training for senior leaders in health sector. We've, we've uh, gone through training for all the people in the ministry, Ghana Health Service, the executive directors of Ghana, uh, CHAG, and other health, health sector leaders. There's, there's a secretariat which has been constituted to commence Ghana uh, disease uh, CDC. And it, we have three physical UOC set up in Ashanti, Northern Region, and Western Region. There's quality management teams being strengthened across the country. We are implementing our national quality strategy and their network of practices of model health centers being implemented across the country. It has already commenced in Bono, Volta, and other regions. The aim of this network practice is to use it to strengthen the primary health care uh, systems in the country. Investment is also made in our emergency response system. Are you aware that we have about 307 ambulances which were brought into the country to improve the pre-hospital care? We've deployed the SOMAS system and that's what we are using for COVID-19 surveillance system. We also have introduced free postgraduate training in the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, which is funded through the Scholarship Secretariat. This idea is to also increase the number of specialists across the country so that we can have specialist care to support primary health care activities across the country. And we have also been strengthening the Food and Drugs Authority. It's now, it has a high ISO certification. It's actually maturity level three for the WHO and even maturity level four 
for uh, pharmacovigilance. And we've improved the, all the regulatory bodies to also regulate the people that they also uh, see. So these are some of the things that we have put in place within the last short period. And this is all part of the roadmap for primary health care, uh, for the achieving universal health coverage. We've costed what we need. For example, we know that by the year 2027, Ghana will be transitioning for the vac um, uh, Gavi Vaccine Alliance. And because of that, we've costed how much it will cost us. And you are also aware recently, the government has introduced to start a local or domestic vaccine production, not only for COVID vaccines, but COVID has taught us a lesson. So we are moving in to have quickly vaccine production in country so that we will not be caught on our ways by the year 2027 and vaccine security and the health security will be also achieved in the country. We will continuously be doing all these things and we are aware that there's, there are a lot of essential services that we have to give to the people of this country. As I said initially, we are trying to optimize the basic health, uh, basic essential health services. We want to also look at child and adolescent centered school health. So we are strengthening school health to make sure that children who are in school have very good health systems in place. And we are also looking at a workplace centered healthcare system and try as much as possible to also improve the organization of services across the country. We are depending on the community health services system. And as I said, we are going to have a network of primary health services, which we will be um, also be uh, developed and the district hospital system also will be developed. As you are aware, we are also moving into what you call Agenda 111. Agenda 111 means that we are going to have hospital, uh, hospital to support all the various 260 districts. So we are putting up 101 district hospitals, which will be state of the art hospitals, which will also be fit for purpose hospitals and then to serve as a first referral center for all the community services that we are having. We also realize that if you want to do this, we have to also take care of mental health services. So uh, in uh, Agenda 111, we are also trying to put a, a psychiatric hospital which will look after all the psych, uh, mental cases in the middle sector in Kumasi and the northern sector also in Tamale. In addition, we also believe that we should have a, refer a secondary referral system to support what we are doing in all the districts and the communities. So we are going to make sure that the six new regions will have also well-equipped, well-standardized um, district hospitals, regional hospitals to cater for all the primary healthcare activities. So in all, we'll be having um, 111 hospitals which have started. His Excellency the President cut the store for the beginning on the 17th of August. And it's ongoing, hopefully, in the next two years to two and a half years, we have all these systems in place. In addition to strengthen the community health systems, the chief systems, and also health center system. So these are some of the things that we are doing. We also are not looking only at just facilities. We also believe that we should have an even uh, distribution of our scarce health, uh, resources. So we are, are going to depend, look at human capital development. Under this human capital development, you want to focus on investing in well trained health workforce in several disciplines, including training of doctors, nurses, community health nurses, and other health professionals in the care of the critically ill and the care of the severely ill, in addition to uh, communi non communicable diseases, which is also in the upstage. So, these are going to be things that we are going to do to support the primary health care activities. And in addition to all what you are doing, all the facilities you are putting up, we are also trying to also put accommodation in these areas so that health workers will get a place to stay. And then we have deprived area allowances also institutionalized. And then career development will also be done. And in addition to this, COVID has taught us something that we should also be doing a lot of virtual trainings. So telemedicine is something that you are going to start to support those who will be in the rural areas. And then when you do this, you then decentralize even clinical training for doctors, nurses, pharmacists to serve in the other areas. And once you have somebody who is under training, they also improve on the health services. And as I said earlier, we are also venturing in domestic 
vaccine development and production to ensure vaccine self-sufficiency and for health security. We are working towards all these things so that by the year 2027, when Gavi pulls out and Ghana has to be fully taking care of all our activities in vaccination, which we are very good at, our expanded program of immunization is one of the best in the country, in the world. So we want to continuously be doing this and then we then have a system in place to make sure that nobody travels for more than 10 kilometers to assess quality health services. So this is what we are doing as a country, but I, I agree with you, it is not very easy, especially with COVID-19, which has made everything slow. So we are doing everything possible. We have seen from the COVID-19 that health should be prioritized. And I can assure you that in the presidency, one of the things that we discuss most is health services. His Excellency, the president chairs the National Tax Force on COVID-19. Sometimes we sit down to the, about late in the night discussing about health. And every time that cabinet meets, health is the first thing that we discuss to make sure that the big good people of this country are healthy. So this is one of the things that we have gained from maybe COVID-19. Health has been prioritized, has been put as number one. And there's a saying that health is wealth. So we believe that going forward, we will make sure that even though we may not achieve what we're supposed to have achieved by the year 2020, we will achieve uh, universal health coverage, if not fully, but most, almost full by the year 2030. And I believe that we will go straightly and finance the roadmap and make sure that the roadmap works for this country. And then by the year 2020, we achieve universal health coverage. Thank you very much. I hope at the end of the two hour session, we in the presidency will get a blueprint of whatever you discuss. And I can assure you that I'll make it available and discuss it with uh, the people who matter, especially even the president, to make sure that this is what the scientists, this is what the health, health practitioners are saying, the public health people are telling us. And they say saying that if you are cutting a, a path, you don't know what is behind you. So those of you who are behind us will then move us and push us to achieve the investor health coverage that we are all looking for. Thank you and God bless all of you. I wish you a very successful uh, conversation and let us know what you concluded and bring your suggestions and we will let we improve on the roadmap that you have made and make it work. Thank you and God bless all of you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nsiasari, Presidential Advisor on Health, Ghana. Thank you so much for that detailed yet succinct uh, presentation. It, from the presentation, it appears quite a lot is, is, is going on and indeed health is wealth, as, like we say. But of course, I think we'll come back a bit later to, to interrogate some of uh, the, 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 the comments or the things that have been said. Um, you know, in the next few minutes, we will start a panel discussion. I believe a lot of these things that Dr. Siasari um, has spoken about will be delved into a bit uh, a, a deeper. So um, this is the policy dialogue uh, being organized by the Conversation Africa uh, with the University of Ghana as a strategic partner. Uh, this is the second uh, in the series. This one focuses on Ghana. The theme is Investor Health. Uh, coverage in Ghana, gaps and opportunities. And as you just heard, uh, Dr. Nsiasari, presidential advisor uh, uh, on health in Ghana, has given us Ghana's journey so far and what we are doing to ensure that uh, Ghana achieves or attains universal health coverage. Ghana has a deadline of uh, December 2021 to hit universal health coverage. And I think in due course, uh, we will put a few questions to Dr. Nsiasari to, 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 to assist us understand properly where we are. Um, so you can join the conversation. Uh, the hashtag to use is uh, TCA policy dialogue, hashtag TCA policy dialogue, hashtag C uh, TCA policy dialogue. And there's also the Q&A box. If you have questions for uh, Dr. Nsiasari or any of the panelists will be speaking with, uh, feel free to drop those comments or those questions there. We'll be happy to read them out and put those questions or comments or or contribution to them and see what they have to say. So yes, we want to uh, head straight and look at uh, 
the panel, uh, like I stated earlier, is an interesting panel uh, made up of very distinguished people uh, uh, who are in the health sector, health and financial sector in, in Ghana. So uh, the first I'll introduce is Dr. Anthony Danso Apia uh, of the School of Public Health and he's the director of the University of Ghana Center for Evidence Synthesis and Policy. Dr. Uh, Anthony Danso Apia has extensive experience in evidence-based approaches and health system strengthening, leading a number of commission systematic reviews uh, and meta-analysis for the WHO and other evidence-based institutions in Europe, which have informed national and global policies. Um, thank you so much uh, for having you, Dr. Anthony uh, Danso Apia. You're welcome to the conversation. Thank you. All right, so um, we also have um, Dr. Gordon Abeka Nkrumah is a senior lecturer in the Department of Public Administration and Health Sciences, Health Services Management at the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, Dr. Abeka Nkrumah's research focuses on understanding contemporary development policy issues, including health systems and health systems financing, gender and household health, uh, poverty and inequality, and lately food security uh, governance. He holds a PhD in development policy and management from the University of Manchester and MPhil in health sciences management, health services management from the University of Ghana and holds a BSc in business administration accounting option from the University of Ghana as well. Uh, Dr. Gordon Abakan Krumah, uh, good to have you. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much and good morning. Good morning. All right, so we have Professor Joshua Yin Denaba Abo. He's a professor of finance at the University of Ghana Business School. Uh, Dr. Professor Abo is a financial economist, qualified accountant, and a professor of finance with many, many years' expertise, mainly in development finance and economics research, but with senior level things as a practitioner, uh, policy, and consulting roles. He holds a PhD in finance from the University of Stellenbosch in Cape Town, South Africa, after completing a PhD coursework that's in financial economics at the University at the Department of Economics, uh, Harvard University in the uh, United uh, States. I must uh, state really that we, we actually have Dr. Uh, uh, Patience Abo and not Dr. Joshua Abbott. I mean, it happens so if, if, if you teach together with your husband in the same institution and you do similar things as far as your, your, your research interests, et cetera, are, are concerned. So, so uh, brief apologies there. Dr. Patience Abbott, uh, you're welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so, um, so we have our panel, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Dansua Pia, Dr. Gordon Abekan Kruma, and Dr. Patience Abo. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us. Um, I guess you all listened to uh, the presidential advisor on health and, and a lot of the things he has said. I, I, I will, if he's still there, uh, Dr. Cesare, are you still with us? Um, I, I have uh, just a few questions for you quickly, then I'll open it up to uh, the panel and, and see what they have to say about uh, um, the strides Ghana is making in this regard. Um, if, if you are there, um, what do you say to the deadline, the December uh, 2021 deadline, deadline Ghana has set for itself to, to, to reach or attain universal health coverage? Dr. Ansiya, sorry. Uh, do we have Dr. Ansiya, sorry? All right, so, so I, I think um, he, he's, he's just moved. Um, perhaps he, he rejoins us and then we get some answers from him in respect of, of, of these. All right, so let me just start off with you, uh, Dr. Gordon Abakan Kruma. Um, you've listened to Dr. Insia Sari. Uh, what, what, what is your initial impression about all the nice things he said Ghana is, is achieving? All right, thank you very much and uh, good morning again to our uh, uh, listeners. Yes, I must say that um, what he said is impressive, and we all know uh, those of us who have been following the ministry, especially after um, the onset of COVID-19, 
as the fact that the ministry has decided to move in some very bold uh, direction with uh, a mix of a uh, lot of things that they want to do. So uh, let me say, if you look at even universal coverage itself in terms of the WHO definition, which says that um, all people have access to good quality, uh, uh, promotive, preventive, uh, curative, rehabilitative uh, health services, uh, whilst ensuring that they do not suffer hardship at the point of uh, payment. Ghana's definition is even much bigger. Ghana is saying that all people have access to high quality services, okay, health services, irrespective of ability to pay at the point of payment. So what it means is that Ghana is even moving a notch higher with respect to what the expectations of the SDGs are. And then the raft of measures that you're putting in place, which is pretty much bold. Uh, for instance, uh, he talked about using uh, uh, primary healthcare services as the fulcrum to deliver UHC, which is fantastic. But there are challenges. And I think that at this moment, those are the sort of things that we need to sort of um, uh, interrogate. Now, even also when you look at the service side, which is using PHC, but if you look at the financing side, they want to use uh, NHIS as the major uh, purchasing vehicle to be able to purchase services. There are issues which we have to interrogate. I will try to pick a few of them because I would imagine that as we go on, we might be delving a lot into some of those issues. Now, let's begin with, let's say, using primary healthcare services as the fulcrum for delivering uh, PHC. Number one, the, the definition of primary healthcare starts from the CHIP zone, which is the community, okay, to the sub-district where we have health centers and polyclinics to the district level where you have district hospitals. Now, this is actually the sort of service infrastructure that is supposed to anchor uh, PHC service delivery. But number one is the issue of mix and, and distribution of healthcare personnel. We all do understand that if you look at the cadre of health staff across the different categories, most of them are concentrated either in the South, okay, or in urban centers. But most of these PHC uh, uh, facilities are within the rural areas. So the first thing is that you are going to be in a big challenge, okay, when it comes to even having the requisite personnel to be able to deliver the service from which PHC is supposed to be the anchor. That is number one. There have been some sort of approaches in terms of how they want to address this, but I'll leave that and we'll come to that later and see how feasible it is. Now you talk of NHIS being the main purchasing vehicle to drive PHC. Now the evidence shows that any, the, 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 the resource envelope for NHIS, only 20% of that resource envelope is spent at the primary care level. What it means is that about 80% of that is spent, okay, at the secondary and tertiary levels. So the point is, if you're going to do this expansion, where then you get the extra funds to be able to finance the vehicle that is your anchor for, for, for PHC. Now, there is evidence also to show that there are about, uh, 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 when you look at the cheap zones, only 49% of them have appropriate uh, uh, delivery facilities. So if you're going to do that, then it means that we need massive investment. The question is, where is the money coming from? Because if we look at the outlook of our budget, where is that money uh, uh, actually coming from? Again, if you look at the last report, we are having working capital issues. For instance, if you look at uh, the working capital of, 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 of uh, the primary care system, okay, it was around, the last time it was calculated, it was around 358 million Ghana cities. And out of that 358 million Ghana cities, about 48% of them were actually debt owed to them by the National Health Insurance Authority. Now we are operating just around 34 to 35% of coverage, okay? And so my point is that once you want to push this, what is going to happen is that we're going to have overload on the NHIS. How do we generate enough money to be able to clear this debt for them to, to begin to uh, uh, operate? Medicines are 
also issues. We have currently about 40%, if you look at the PHC system, only 40% of the required tracer medicines are available. Okay, so how do you use these things to be able to drive your PHC? I think we have other colleagues here, so it is important to probably just say, these are my initial thoughts. But I think that as we go on, we can begin to interrogate all the very, but, but I, like I said earlier on, I must commend the ministry and the government. These are very, very audacious steps that the government wants to take. But there are critical issues that we've got to interrogate and address just as the few ones that have already uh, are put uh, on the table. And as we go on, I think that we can interrogate some of these things more. Thank you very much. Very so, well. Thank you so much. Surely we, we will do that. Um, so, uh, Dr. Patience Abo, I'm, I'm, I'm just coming to you right away. And I must say that uh, Dr. Patience Asewe Abo is a senior lecturer at the Department of Public Administration and Health Sciences Management at the University of Ghana Business School. She's a researcher with the African Economic Research Consortium. Her research interests include healthcare governance, health service management, uh, health policy, and socioeconomic effects on health outcomes. Very interesting background there. So, um, Dr. Abo, um, uh, the presidential advice on health is giving us a very flowery uh, picture or impression of what the situation looks like in Ghana in, in respect of. Um, the country's march towards UHC. Um, given all the things you've done in the space in which you operate, is that an accurate reflection of what's on the ground? Thank you so much, uh, Salom. Um, very interesting discussion we are having. And uh, like you I earlier said, it is so timely, considering the situation in which we are globally uh, when it comes to healthcare. I, like my colleague, uh, mentioned, I think the roadmap by the uh, government or the Ministry of Health with regards to universal health coverage, when I went through, I glanced through it just this morning, I was so, so impressed for just about two things that really caught my attention. The issue of um, really doing something about school health uh, and beefing up the care we give to um, um, our children and uh, uh, young people of school going ages and the measures uh, that the roadmap seems to spell out to deal with health uh, around those ages. I was really impressed because it's something that I have uh, personally researched into and I've always been worried that uh, our schools do not seem to be part of the, the conversation when it comes to health. Uh, you have schools that are built with their surroundings completely concrete, with a lot of concrete, no plants, uh, no playing grounds in most of, especially with the private um, sector. Uh, and then you see people, children just go to school, sit down and just learn and not have space to exercise and then um, have space to have a very healthy gaseous exchange, if you like, because all the plants have been taken off from the schools. And I get worried when children go to school and they stay there for all these hours in such conditions. And so when I saw that part of the roadmap that clearly um, put in measures to look at how children can be kept healthy in their schools, I was so happy because I am more of a, I, I lean towards health promotion rather than uh, the curative aspect of it. Unfortunately, most of our efforts seem to be focused on the curative part of healthcare. And I think that is one of the key Things that is causing us a lot of pressure and a, a, a lot of um, unnecessary stress, if you if you like, if we were to shift our attention a little bit away from the curative uh, part of health services and look at the preventive and the promotion of health, maybe our um, health uh, professionals will be less uh, uh, busy. Uh, like they they always come under so much pressure and uh, it, it affects the quality of the services they deliver. So I am happy to see this roadmap and I'm so excited, like I said, I see a lot of health promotion uh, strategies in that roadmap and that makes me really happy. I believe as we go along, we will look at some of the areas that maybe the roadmap uh, it's a bit silent on. For instance, um, the definition of universal, sorry, universal health coverage says all people. And I was, I was looking at the Ghana definition that said all people in Ghana. And I'm asking myself, all people, does it include the very vulnerable? Does it include the homeless? 
does all people mean that people who do not have proper accommodation, people who live in very poor neighborhoods, are they all part of this all people that we are mentioning in the uh, definition of universal health coverage? And what is the roadmap actually saying about these people? I think as we go along, we might probably find if these people are also part of this all people that are uh, mentioned in the definition of universal health coverage. So I believe it's a very interesting uh, roadmap by the Ministry of Health and the, probably the Ghana Health Service. Um, we will see where the holes are and what we can do to fill them as we go along. Thank you so much. Very interesting. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Abo. Uh, very interesting the point you made about uh, the emphasis on curative care rather than uh, preventive, which really should be the place uh, we should be heading. Uh, but wouldn't you say that emphasis is as a result of the vehicle that Ghana appears to be using, which is a national health insurance scheme? Um, because you first have to fall sick, go to the hospital before the, 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 the usefulness of the scheme will, will kick in. So wouldn't you say that that emphasis and the amount of resources that we've channeled to this, I mean, the earmarked uh, 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 levies, uh, SNIT, uh, 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 contribution, et cetera, you know, appear to be given a lot of fodder to the NHIS, which in fact, and indeed, is a curative system. Wouldn't you think that that is why the emphasis is on curative, when really we should be looking at preventive? You are so right about that. And that is maybe when we get to the point where we are looking at whether the NHIS should go through some kind of review, then we might want to look at the expansion of that base. I mean, what does NHIS really cover and uh, the things it covers, would, will it actually help us at, in the long run? Because if NHIS, it's just about you getting sick in the first place and then you can utilize it, then there's a problem, like, like you rightly said. Can we have NHIS uh, coverage, for instance, for people to just go for screening? Can I just walk into a facility with NHIS, um, haven't paid my premium? Can I just go and check my um, sugar level? Can I just, and would that be catered for? Can I go for screening like breast examination for, because breast cancer is increasing in Ghana. It's, not, it's no longer a Western uh, condition anymore. It's here with us. So can women just walk into the facility with NHIS and have their breast examined? Can people have their um, uh, cervical cancer vaccines, for instance? I'm not sure at the moment if it is covered with, um, under the NHIS, but these are all screening programs that will prevent people from getting ill in the first place and increasing the number of um, patients in our OPDs and maybe even on admission. Can we have NHIS cover screening processes, um, um, preventive health, for instance, so that people don't even get the disease because it is more expensive treating diseases than it is to prevent it. Maybe when we look at the review of the NHIS, then we'll, we'll probably look at what it covers and what it should cover if it doesn't. Yeah. All right. Um, so, uh, Dr. Um... Dan, so up here, um, you, you, your quick impression on, on Dr. Siasari's, uh, 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 you know, nine uh, remarks on Ghana's march to UHC. Yes, I think, first of all, I should thank our audience and then those people who are listening to us. Um, I think this conversation is overdue. And then I, I'm happy with the, uh, the impressive delivery by Dr. Antonio Insia, and I wish if you can find out if he's still around, because probably what I, I want him to, he we can't speak to the government now, as we are here, the president, uh, so to speak, but we can speak to his advice, and you want him to not as a report, then later on package as a report to send to him, which never get to where it's supposed to go, but standing or sitting here with us and then hearing what we are saying so that he would take it forward because there are so many things that probably if he was around with us, I would appreciate. I've gone to his office sometime, maybe two times, he hasn't seen me before, but I went to his office when he was the DJ and I didn't meet him. And this is an opportunity. So if he leaves us over here, it is a, I don't know, Probably, if you can find out, he's still around because you want to dialogue with him as as the presidential advisor as well. This is something we're sharing ideas. We are not going to take sizes, so we want to. If uh, that is 
what I'll say. But let me take uh, what, what he said. It is impressive in the sense that uh, tracing back to history, we can see that this universal health care system coverage has been with us uh, since uh, maybe creation. Because everyone in your homes, everybody will want to get the best care as possible if the person is sick. But one thing after the World War, Second World War, it has been made uh, like fundamental human rights. So government have been mandated to take actions to make sure that the best care is delivered to the populace and that uh, should cover everyone. And then if you look at the roadmap that he put forward, it's so interesting, but I was wondering, what estimates inform the, the predictions that is by 2030, we're going to get a cover, a, a, a UNC, that is universal healthcare coverage for all people. And as my colleagues have already said, this is something that, uh, that scientists, normally scientists have used this kind of things and anytime we don't achieve, from my experience with WHO, people think that WHO is a special entity that when WHO talks, nobody should maybe interrogate. Not true. I've been involved in so many WHO platforms and I've questioned the, 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 the kind of assumptions and the models that we have used to make predictions. For example, in the area of uh, neglected tropical diseases, once in a while, we had this... Um, Trazicontel for one a disease called schistosomiasis. This schistosomiasis has been with us for so long. And when uh, we had uh, some countries coming together and made declaration that they were going to give mass uh, production of Trazicontel to countries affected by this disease, all the people came together calculating the number of Trazicontel that, that is going to be released. And then looking at the population, they said next five years. Latest by 10 years, we are going to eradicate the disease. I looked at them and said, what are you saying? Are you sure? But so to speak, I was the only one who was on the opposing side. And I said, am I probably not seeing what they are seeing or am I talking nonsense? But I said that the estimate that you're pu putting in, the very present, the, the mere presence of price contact does not, will not translate into uh, getting all people treated. And even uh, they gave me 10 years. And I said that this one would take more than 60 years or 50 years and even more than 100 years. And they were laughing at me. But now they, they, uh, the time that they thought that we were we going to eradicate schistosomiasis was 2020. 2020 has come and gone. And even some countries are even mapping to see the, 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 the kind of the, the prevalence or the, the endemicity of the countries. You saw that I'm just beginning to think that politicians and scientists like normally come with estimates, just make projections, and I don't know. And that is why probably Africa, we are lagging behind. Now, WHO is talking about implementation research. That is one of the, the top most priority. Why is this so? Because WHO has seen that all the policies that we have already uh, introduced into Africa, normally most of them have not worked. Why is this so? So they are looking at now what to next, why and how. So these are the things that you're looking for. So my part of this one is the why and the how and with what. That is what I will be interested in. As for selling the, the top and the, 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 the selling, uh, maybe the story about uh, universal healthcare, I don't even want to listen to that anymore because it's something that we have. Go to history and we see the declarations. Yesterday I was going through them almost every year. But where are we now? It is up to us to now begin to rethink and to recreate the global. Uh, this uh, the, we have to know that we are different in each even countries. We have different dynamics. We have different uh, disease, maybe context, and we have different dynamics in terms of prevalence. And then the HL, so many things happening. So that if you normally buy into what WHO is saying, which is one uh, size fits all, and then we just take it like that. We will not. We are not going anywhere. It is about time that we develop capacity ourselves. Begin to now look at our circumstances and situations to be able to use that one to define and design what works for us, but not uh, the, what that is coming from the global maybe uh, uh, 
uh, uh, discussion until we begin to do that, we are not going anywhere because the estimates that we gave, I think, are they coming from Ghana or is something that we have taken from the WHO estimates and using for Ghana, it will not work for us. Most guy like that our people are using across the country and in the hospitals are something that have been imported from somewhere else. And let me use this example, it's critical. Most hospitals are using guidelines from either the UK, I'm not saying it's not good because in the absence of anything, if you don't have anything and there's something over there, it's better to use that one instead of just saying there's nothing. I've been involved in guideline development. And normally, if we are talking about the guidelines developed in the UK context, so many countries are not included. We take the Europe, Central Europe, Australia, and some parts, and that's all, not even America. So the evidence, the data that is generated is around the countries that have the same system as the UK. Not Sub-Saharan Africa, no low and middle income countries have been taken into consideration. And you know that. The, 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 the delivery of healthcare is dependent on the, 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 the infrastructure and the resources, the both the human and then the, 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 the uh, material infrastructure that we have. So when this guideline has been done in the UK context, and you take it and you bring it to Ghana and you begin to use it to say that because it's hypertension, so it's hypertension. But the context is completely different. The expertise and mm. the Different. How can you use this one and think that you achieve the same as they are? And which measures are you? So I'm beginning to think that it is about time for us to be able to maybe think and then recreate and begin to use what we have to meet the problems that we have. Otherwise, we are not going anywhere because we can come back and always talk about this interesting roadmap. Have we all always achieved the roadmap? The 2020, 2021, we didn't achieve the 2021. We are not going to achieve it now. 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, 30. We give some of the terms that we give are so short because maybe whether political or something, I don't know. But I don't think Dr. Nsiasal is speaking as a political leader because he's somebody who is a scientist and a medical doctor and always speaks the, 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 to the uh, the, 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 to speak to medicine rather than that. And I right. wanted him to be around so that we can discuss this and then see the way forward. For example, he's saying that we are going to now uh, develop vaccines in Ghana. It's so fascinating how and when and all those in, with what are we going to develop the vaccine. And I, I, I think on that, on that, I think the, the, the president set up a, a, a vaccine production tax force thing also uh, that is being led by uh, Professor Kovna uh, Frimpon I think recently there was some uh, 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 report on that. So I think they've given themselves quite uh, some time to be able to put in place the building blocks uh, to, to be able to see to the realization of that. But very great points you, you're making there. But just to move the discussion point, yeah. um, Dr. Abakan Kruma, um, we, you know, the, we're speaking about universal health coverage, health for all, et cetera. By December 2021, we are just about some three, four months away from that particular target. Um, it, it appears far, you know, when you look at what the current figures are, and very laudable when you look at it in a certain context as well. As we speak, NHIA, NHIS records about 41% coverage of the population, 41%. Of course, NHIS is not the only uh, means of gaining access to, to, to healthcare. There's a private health insurance scheme, for example, which has less than 200,000 people on it. And that is very slight compared to the number on the health insurance scheme. And we have others who pay out of pocket. But the whole idea is to discourage the out of pocket payment because that works against um, universal health coverage in, in, in the sense that not everybody at the point of use is able to make that payment. So what really should the strategy be? And I know it's a matter of finance. Health is finance health insurance and ensuring that everybody comes into the net is an issue of financing. And, 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 and I know that it is quite uh, uh, easy to just step out and get everybody recorded or registered on the National Health Insurance Scheme. But it is not just about the enrollment or the registration. It is what happens when they go to the point of use. What will happen is that we will have the expenditure of the NHIS or the NHIA floating many times you know, over because you don't have a lot more people 
having access to healthcare, together with the moral hazards, everything. What should be the strategy? Financing is very important. Where should they get money from? Because it appears that the Ministry of Finance may be at its wit's end. Initially, when uh, Ken Ofurata, the finance minister, came, we saw that the 2.5% VAT was made flat, which meant that some more money for the National Health Insurance. At some point, we saw the capping of it, which also meant some money being taken away from the health insurance scheme, et cetera. SNAP may not be generating that much. Premium payment is not the best. So look at all the financing options the NHIS has. That's the levy, the SNAP contribution, the premium, the, the investment, I mean, the, the returns on investment. I doubt if they have any serious investment now because we know that from 2009, uh, uh, where the funding gap began to show, they have since depleted a lot of their investments to, to, to pay claims, et cetera. What should the strategy of financing be? Because the NHI has cried many times that they do not have money. And indeed, that is a fact. When you look at their books, it appears every month they incur not less than 3 million Ghana city debt to providers. And a month, you are looking at 90 million, 100 million debt to providers. Meanwhile, the, 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 the revenue they get comes no close to that figure. What should be the strategy, really? What should they be doing? All right, thank you very much. So, uh, Salom, I think that when we talk about uh, universal health coverage, I think I would look at it as a, 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 an all health systems approach solution. Of course, for which finance is one, but finance doesn't stand alone. Finance moves with production. So we can look at it from two perspectives, and then we can also look at the, the other health systems components, which would help us deliver uh, UHC. So now let's begin to look at it from the perspective of uh, financing itself. Uh, there are two areas in terms of making sure that we can shore up the financing. Uh, that is the, the resource envelope of the NHIS. The first one is what I call additionality. And then the second one is uh, uh, efficiency. So if we come to the additions, the current model, all of us know that that model is not sustainable. But I think that it also comes, uh, it also depends on where you come from. And Salom, let me say that uh, my, my uh, liberal and pro-market uh, uh, values, okay, sometimes do take the best of me. So I want to uh, state a forehand what my uh, biases are. I am somebody who is a liberal and I am pro-market. So, so the fact of the matter is that we can just uh, eat our cake and have it. The guys just don't have the money, okay? So it is either we may increase uh, uh, the, the tax rate and bring in a lot more money and then say that everybody gets access to it, or there could be the possibility of having some sort of a cap so that the NHIS can finance up to, let's say, primary care level. And then outside of primary care, we can then have some sort of co-payment. And then those co-payments will be through some sort of uh, uh, a different insurance mechanism. And we can then be decide to construct data that helps us to identify the vulnerable. And then the state can provide uh, what I will call the premium to pay for those who are vulnerable. But outside of primary care level, a different uh, financing mechanism, which is based on some sort of insurance, will kick in. And there are examples in other countries where they have uh, a two or three tier insurance system. So we could have that just to be able to show up. Now, the second part is that there's got to be a lot of uh, uh, work within the NHIS itself to be able to improve on the use of money. Now, if you look at the medical loss ratio of the insurance right now, it is just too high. The amount of money they commit to administrative and operational expenses is just unbelievable because at the moment, the insurance has been hovering around 35 to 36%. It went to 40% and came back. Right now, it is just around 36% coverage. But the, the, the amount of money that goes into operations is just too high. So I'm asking myself, when we, we get to around, say, 70%, what is going to be the operational cost? And we need to look specifically at what they use the NHIS money for. Sometimes some of the money goes into things that are not directly related to financing 
care. Okay, that is number one. Number two, we also need to look at the issue of preventive care. And that's what my colleague talked about. Now, if we can begin to, but you see, the problem is that when you bring preventive and promotive care into the NHIS, that is a lot of work for them because it is not easy for them to do these their DRGs to be able to create appropriate tariffs. So that's a lot of work for them. But we need to figure out how we can uh, create a system that takes care of preventive and promotive uh, health so as to be able to bring down the bills. Then number three, we need to go to the production centers. So now the, the centers are producing at such inefficiency levels and those inefficiencies are being paid for by the health insurance. So we need to look at a model that makes our production centers a lot more efficient and how to be able to deal with, with, with uh, 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 moral hazards and, and corruption within the facility levels. Now, when it comes to how to deal with efficiency, I have said over and over again that why can't we look at plowing back money that government of Ghana every day pushes into our providing centers or our production centers as salaries. I'll give you a typical example. Can we have a system, say, where a lot of the Ghana health service facilities, okay, let's say at, we can begin to look at it from the tertiary up to the secondary. We can pilot at that level. Where these facilities are no longer, they no longer belong to Ghana health service but they belong to what you call a, a, a state interest in business. And these entities are pure business entities who now render service and health insurance can pay the market rate for their services. And they use that money to be able to pay salaries. What it means is that all the money that goes into salaries can then go into the health insurance. That is a sure way of making sure that People are very efficient at the production centers. So I think that that is one area that we can look at. Even at the primary level, we can de de begin to de develop incentive structures that can send private people into these spaces and make production a lot more efficient in those places. Now, another area that takes a lot of money from the health insurance is medicines. And this is because our procurement system and our supply chain systems are a bit defective. Now, if we can fix that problem, what is going to happen is that hospital can, can, can reduce the amount of open market purchases that they make, which is more expensive. And because the they, uh, health insurance owes them and they are not able to pay these supplies, these suppliers also jack up the prices, which at the end of the day, they send back to the health insurance for payment. So we can begin to look at some of all these things to be able to plow back a bit of money back into the insurance and look at the possibility of either raising the tax or creating a second tier insurance that caters for expenditure outside of the primary care. Doc, I'm quite interested in the, the, the point you made about the second tier insurance because I recall uh, that prior to 2016, there was this uh, National Health Insurance Scheme Review Committee that submitted a report to the president. Uh, I mean, that committee was chaired by Dr. Professor Tim, who is quite popular in this arena. And one of the things they suggested was that we should move away from the system as it is today and then uh, do what we call the PHC and maternal care, that would be for everybody. And so by that alone, you would have achieved the universal health coverage because now everybody will have it. So beyond the PHC and maternal care, everything else will come into the second tier. And then now you pay premiums or you pay something little, you have a card, et cetera, and then you, you, could, you, you could be uh, attended to. It, it appeared at the time that it was quite a laudable idea and, and a lot of uh, uh, social... Uh, inequality or equality, people were happy with it, etc. But for five years down the line, we've not really heard much about that particular report. I think it was one of the questions that I was waiting for Dr. Nsiasari to, to, to deal with. And um, hopefully he joins us later to, 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 to respond to that. I don't know what to make of that review. And so I'm not sure if we were going to shelve that review 
and do another review again to look at exactly what it is. Well, thank you very much, Selop. Uh, I, I also don't know whether we'll do another review, but the fact of the matter is that truth is truth. You can do the review several times, but what is feasible and what is technically efficient, at the end of the day, you come back to the same point. Uh, uh, and it seems to me that, yes, I've read through that document a little bit, but it seems to me that the approach that I'm suggesting is basically what is contained in that. So let's assume that you form a new entity and I say I'm on that entity. This is the sort of idea I'm going to give, which is already captured there. So, so, so like I'm saying, we just have to... to uh, to, to be truthful with ourselves. It is either we jack up the rates, but if you do that, that is politically, uh, 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 I would say, disastrous. And I don't think there is any government that at the moment would have uh, 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 the strength to want to do that, okay? Now, that's why I remember when they, they came up with the COVID levy, the 1% COVID levy. I was interviewed on City, and I said that it's a great idea. But I don't think it should be called COVID levy. It should be called NHIS levy so that that money goes to NHIS. And then things like uh, emergency health and all of that could now be financed through NHIS. So for me, from the financing side, at the moment, as much as I can see, it is either we, put, we, we pull up the rates or we go through a second tier. But the point is that if you look at PHC, PHC covers majority of, 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 of the disease bedding in Ghana. So what then it means is that at that level, you would have catered for almost everybody. And once you move to the secondary level, then the second tier insurance then kicks in. The issue that people have made is about what about the vulnerable? What it means is that we need to be a lot more hardworking and begin to tackle the issue of data. The reason why we've not been able to do those things is the absence of data. But when are we going to make sure that our data systems are right? We can take advantage of this to be able to build uh, a robust data, use means testing to be able to find out the vulnerable. And if it means government is actually paying for their premiums, that is fine. And then we tackle service delivery. We decentralize them. We, we, we let them operate like businesses and make savings from there back into the insurance system. Very well. So um, just to remind the community that uh, your comments or your, your questions are welcome. Look at the Q&A box, uh, drop your questions there, and we'll be happy to uh, put them to our panelists. Uh, the hashtag uh, to use on all social media communication in respect of this dialogue is hashtag TCA policy dialogue, TCA policy dialogue. In the next few minutes, we will start reading out your questions to uh, my panelists, so so they, they share their quick thoughts on 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 them. Um, so, Dr. Abo, um, it, it appears that Ximba is just uh, um, with us, or is just about you know hitting us. Universal health coverage. Uh, what is your 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 thoughts about its feasibility? Is it something you think that we can achieve? Indeed, when in Dr. Sir was speaking, he mentioned the fact that the Ghana card, which is now being universal, you know, is, is being converted to the National Health Insurance card, which means that once you have Ghana card, you can get to the hospital and get taken care of. I, I didn't quite get the details of that. I don't know what your sense of that is, Dr. Salam, <laughs> so that makes uh, the two of us. I actually didn't get how the Ghana card, um, that whole transition, I didn't quite get it well, but I'm sure uh, Dr. Nsian Sari is still around and will probably uh, explain better how that card is uh, being used instead of the National Health Insurance uh, card. Um, I'm not too sure about how it works um, practically, but um, sorry, were you saying something? Yeah, so, so initially, so, so that's fine. So, so uh, we're trying to get them back to, to help us appreciate those points better. But initially, okay. you also made a point about pre preventive care, et cetera. And that's quite a lot of money to, to, to be sent in there. But how, how do you hope to deal with issues of abuse that will arise from the pre preventive side of things? Somebody just wakes up in the morning, he says, I feel like screening myself for this particular condition. It could be breast cancer, it could be anything. 
the person walks to a facility and gets screened. Somebody has to pick up the bill. And should that, how should it be in order to uh, deal with abuse? Yeah, um, definitely when it comes to human, human behavior, um, you cannot completely rule out the issue of abusing the systems uh, when people get the opportunity. But I, I believe with the same idea of the, uh, uh, this whole community-based kind of healthcare, if, if these people are not just coming into, uh, let me use the word, the more sophisticated health facilities, but they are just going straight to whatever facility is available to them in their communities. And um, in this case, before you decide to probably just walk into a, a, a community center, for instance, or a CHIPS compound to screen for early detection of various conditions, you might, uh, you would have already understood what could probably put you at risk of developing certain things. And then you look at yourself and then based on the information you have about your health, you think, oh, maybe around this age, uh, looking at these factors, um, in my life, I, sh I will probably be prone to getting this particular condition. So let me just go and check and monitor. So here, before we even start embarking on that kind of uh, strategy with health promotion, I want to think, say that health literacy should be on top of the whole agenda. I think there are a lot of people who are completely ignorant about even very basic issues that concerns their health in Ghana. Uh, people are educated, but they are not educated when it comes to health. So there are uh, our literacy rates generally might be above 70, like the statistics will say, but I don't think our health literacy levels are at that, those levels. And that is very dangerous. We need to understand certain basic things about our health. And with that kind of knowledge, if we are able to raise the health literacy rates within the country, then nobody will just sleep and wake up and for the fun of it, just walk into a system and say, I'm checking my blood pressure. You might, you will have to, um, have understood certain things about yourself in, with regards to your health, and then you, you think you are at risk of certain conditions for which reason you want to just take steps in screening and making sure that these things are detected on time and so that you don't get uh, the disease even in the first place. So health literacy would have to go on and be increased in the whole nation before we even decide on um, saying that we want to increase the issue of prevention and, and uh, health promotion, making sure that people don't even get ill in the first place and increase our disease burden in the long run. So health literacy, I believe, is the key vehicle here to prevent uh, the diseases and to prevent the issue of abuse, as you rightly said. Yeah. All right, um, thank you so much, interesting. So, um, yes. Yeah, I think just a, a little bit of addition to what uh, my colleague uh, just said. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so, you know, my colleague made a fantastic point about uh, the fact that the system won't be abused, which I agree with her because we already have uh, experience uh, in this. There is uh, what you call children weighing, isn't it? Tell them you sent your kids for weighing. Do you abuse uh -huh. weighing? Yes, yes. You don't, okay? No, so don't. we can have what you call adult weighing. And it's something that Dr. Nsian Sari himself has been talking about a lot. So if it is adult weighing, then the adult will be given uh, what you call uh, times that they have to count for weighing. And people, if we have good data, people who have pre-existing conditions would be notified and, and, and information will be sent to them when they should come for weighing. It's just like when you're in the UK and you have pre-existing conditions around this time, uh, uh, my colleague Pat will tell you, who's, who lived in the UK, will tell you that around this time, you would be uh, receiving uh, a text message on your phone, come for your job. So I don't think that if we do it the right way, it's, it will be abused. It is just the initial work to build the credible data, okay, and structure this and deliver it. And especially if we decentralize it, like Pat is saying, from the community, community level, then there is no way this will be abused. Thank you. Very well. I, I see. All right. So, uh, Dr. Danso up here. Very interesting conversation so far. Uh, preventive, the financing bits, et cetera. Talking about preventive, I mean, we are in a pandemic season and, and a lot of things have been said in respect of this. Uh, how or what lessons, in your view, 
do you think that Ghana has uh, learned from you know the COVID nineteen pandemic and 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 how has the pan- pandemic uh, affected Ghana's march to universal health coverage? Many have said that the pandemic threw up a lot of difficulties and challenges with Ghana's health system, challenges that existed but we did not know or we did not take seriously. What lessons do you think we can learn from this? And how has the pandemic affected our work to UHC? Uh, thank you for uh, uh, this. Yes, I would say in the first place, yes, I would commend Ghana and for that matter, the, the president for leadership that was shown during the pandemic. I would, I would also say that probably this stemmed from the fact that Ghana uh, was used by the WHO when we had this Ebola in, in Guinea and other places in West Africa so that we had the technical know-how already. When the pandemic uh, occurred, I think I traveled from the UK around March to Ghana. When I was coming through the airport, there were no checks where, where you have traveled, whatever, this and this. But when I came to Ghana, I saw a long queue and a whole lot of checks that takes that they were. Where have you been? Have you experienced this? Have you done this? Where even developed countries had not started, Ghana had already started. So sometimes when you say things go well, most is more likely for those people, those in the, 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 the global south who have done well for the achievement to be subsumed or to be downgraded in the midst of this. But I think Ghana has done extremely very well. So uh, that's why there's commendation for that. But that cannot be said without gaps or something that we can, uh, lessons that we cannot maybe learn from this. And one thing I'll say that um, the government took leadership, one. Now the, the gaps that we have learned is that we were not really prepared for such a scale. And then we are happy that this, the, the infections did not translate into the severe forms that would really uh, require hospital uh, in, uh, in large numbers of hospital admissions as occurred in most of the global north, in the UK and other countries. If it had happened that way, then that's when you would feel the heat of the COVID. But because most of them were bound to moderate, it didn't get to that point. And although we saw that our hospital beds were maybe getting filled up, we didn't get to that. Uh, we didn't get to that point. I will say that uh, the government has learned lessons, and scientists have learned lessons in, in the school of public health. Other people were asking, "Where are you when it started? When we needed data?" we were so slow in coming forward with the the, the data. After that people, Harvard has set up, uh, uh, this John Hopkins and other people have set up this live uh, data updates and we were all tapping from there, we didn't. It takes us on our way because all that we have been dealing with are outbreaks. That is the the, some of this, no pandemic, but epidemic outbreaks. So not to that scale. So these are some of the things that now, in the, in the public health sector, in the institutions, we now know that some of these things can happen and we know those who can maybe lead this aspect. Now they have, initially we were just teaching as teachers, but now we know those who are now going to be the experts in those areas who as soon as something happens, we will call them. I know that now it has brought this uh, Professor Kino into the landline who has been dealing with outbreaks and Dr. Uh, one of them, Dr. Uh, 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 Saki, to the landline, and then even the universal hospital. And those. So these are some of the things that we learned. Well, now we have the blocks, we have the, things, the expertise in place to use when we have such outbreaks. I will say that now government has responded very well. Had it not been the COVID, these hospitals that now they are building across the country with the, to now the COVID help us to assess district without district hospitals. And now we have more than 100 district. I think it is something district without district hospitals. Now government is with hospitals, yeah. So this is, it is through the COVID. Now government knows that if there was anything, you had only Noguchi as the reference laboratory in Ghana. Now, how can you transfer somebody disease with this if you get to the severe form? By the time you travel for maybe even by plane, 
from uh, maybe uh, the northern side to Ghana. The person will have uh, passed that way. So we need to now strategically uh, set up centers across the country which will deal with such uh, epidemics. So this is also a, a way forward. And then not only that, government is now trying to sensitize and strategize that that if you look at doctor and the even specialist ratio across the country, those who have been trained as specialists who can provide specialist care, all of them are scattered in Accra and some of them in Kumasi. The rest, you can't find them, no people in the other towns and cities. So governments is building these structures to entice them, to give them, he, he calls something like, what is it called? The rural something, something. You are familiar with that probably. I'm not expecting this way. I'm uh, expecting evidence generation and how you can translate evidence into policies. But this is cross-cutting. So I have to show interest in this aspect. That's why I've decided to also to take part of this one. So government has responded very well. But I think going forward, we need capacity. What I mean by that? Capacity that will generate evidence. And they, we are not talking about just evidence. We are talking about robust evidence, evidence that is systematically synthesized. And that is the area that I, I, I specialize in. Normally, when normally we base our evidence decisions on anecdotal evidence, that is pick and choose or what is available to us. But there's a paradigm shift now. The global north have changed. No policy or decision is made without systematically synthesizing the evidence. And now WHO, after about just about within the state of three years, five years ago, has started also. It didn't start it, it didn't start that long, it, even with WHO. If Ghana can buy into this idea and train more people in the area of generating best evidence, these are the evidence, this is the evidence that will support sound decisions and policy. Without that, I think even the COVID, we, the lessons we've learned will not go anywhere because we don't have what it takes to even uh, mitigate a, uh, this uh, uh, problem if it even, if another one, maybe there's another outbreak. So I feel that. Government should spend a lot of money, train people, and then let me come back to the vaccine quickly. He said that we are going to, yes, develop vaccine, which is great idea, innovative, and I appreciate that probably I didn't put my first uh, earlier statement well. It is we acknowledge and we appreciate that. But now we have the expertise. When you develop the vaccine in the lab, you have to translate it into the public space for clinical trialists to now begin to assess the efficacy and those all the factors associated with this. Do we have clinical trialists? In Ghana, we have only one uh, university, University of Ghana School of Public Health, which has a course in clinical trial. Do you know how many people normally are enrolled? We have only about two, three, maximum five. And these are the people that are enrolled onto this program. We need government to now invest into this because if you come into develop, you have to know that yet, yeah, we need people who will test and who will do this. Nepal is looking for people, and this is not even across, even in Ghana alone, across Africa. We don't have this expertise. That is why most of the time, even trials, if vaccines are brought over here, those who develop the vaccine have to bring their uh, experts over down to, to, to um, roll this one up for us. So I think it's about time that we look at the capacity building in the area of trials, that building capacity in clinical trials and how we can synthesize the best evidence to inform policy and decisions. And that is my take. So Ghana has done well. You have to have, I really applaud Ghana. And the way forward, these are the lessons that we can learn to see how we can maybe um, um, strategize in the, when epidemics break up again in the future. Thank you. Very well. Uh, Dr. Abo, it, it appears very little has been said in all these uh, UHC talk uh, generally across the board and across many fora on the place of uh, mental health. It appears to be an area that has been generally forgotten. What can we do to rope in people who they have issues in that aspect of health, how, what can we do to rope them into the, 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 under the umbrella of UHC so they are not left behind? Yeah, um, it's, it's, I am so excited you mentioned it, but I was just thinking about it because 
if you remember um, Dr. Nsian Sari's um, address, he, when he mentioned the targeted uh, groups of uh, the roadmap to universal health coverage, I listened carefully and he mentioned the categories of people um, that were targeted under this uh, UA, uh, UHC uh, uh, agenda. And I didn't hear that much about people living with disability, uh, what is in that roadmap for such people, and then issues of mental, mental health uh, disorders. And you are so right. Recently, um, I'm sure we all have heard on the news the kind of killing, some of the killings that are going on, the criminal activities that are going on. I certain back and looking at it as a nurse, um, sometimes I see most of the issues to be some mental disorders that have probably gone undetected. And uh, so we cannot just look at it in terms of criminality. We need to look at it in terms of our mental health as a, as a people. And, and I want to actually appeal that this whole roadmap takes another look at what aspect of this roadmap will actually look at the issues of uh, mental health, awareness first of all, and then treatment for those who have one challenge or, or the other. We still live in a country where people, people are suffering from, especially after COVID-19, you will be surprised to know that there are a lot of health professionals who are suffering from depression. There are a lot of health professionals who are having anxiety attacks. People are panicking. Who are, these are even health professionals. So look at it from the perspective of the population, people who are not health professionals, the things they are going through when it comes to their mental health. And what have we really done to address these challenges in the population? I think most of, like I said, most of the efforts there again are about, oh, when you, you have these symptoms, go to the clinic, have your temperature checked. Nobody is talking about their mind, but health includes everything, your mind, your body, and every other as your social life. It looks like we are a bit silent on that part of our healthcare when it comes to the mind. Diseases of the mind are equally part of our health and uh, we need to pay more attention. And so communities should be empowered as much as we are doing this whole um, CHIPS compound and we are doing um, all this primary healthcare. I think there need to be some more efforts and measures put in place to deal with mental um, challenges at that level, at that very basic level, at, the, at your doorstep, so that when somebody is having a depressed, a, a depressive episode, somebody is having an anxiety attack, somebody, somebody is really um, probably having their thinking processes a bit distorted, so that they don't have to go all the way to Ankafo, they don't have to go all the way to Asalong down, they don't need to come to Pantai. Just by where they live, they can quickly just walk into a facility that deals with mental. I'm glad. I think the Ghana Health Service has instituted something like that, where in most of the government hospitals these days, when you go, there are mental health um, clinics and units within the general hospital uh, settings. But people don't even know about it. I'm sure there are people who go to Kolebu, for instance, and do not know that there's a mental health unit in Kolebu. You do not necessarily have to go to Pantai. You do not have to go to Asalam. When you go to any general hospital, there's a mental health uh, unit in there. But the awareness there again, people, we are a bit silent on these facilities and people do not even know. So in our um, bid to send universal health uh, coverage uh, using the primary health care system, let's pay some attention to our mental health because mental health it's not just about somebody uh, misbehaving. Mental health could result in criminalities. Mental health affects productivity because people go to work and because they are not sound up there, they are not able to give their best. So it is a very, very important component of our healthcare delivery. And I'm, I'm very happy you, you raised it. The, the roadmap is a bit silent on that part of uh, the healthcare delivery. And I just jotted it down and I'm glad you mentioned it. I think the targeted group should include people living with disability and then people who need help with uh, mental health uh, issues. Yeah, at the very basic very level, well. not at, yes, at very, the very high yeah. levels. Very, very interesting. Um, the, the, two, the, the two cohorts or the two groups of persons you mentioned, the mental uh, health people and yeah. the people with disabilities. These are a very important segment, the mental health especially. Very, very yeah. important aspect of our health. But it doesn't look very attractive. And, and, and the stigma around it, uh, to the extent that somebody having depression issues walks to uh, maybe a salam down or pantan, for example, somebody sees him or her 
in that facility. And, you know, the talk is maybe this person is going mad. And so I met him at Panther, I met him at Asalandao. And yeah. the stigma around that, you know, how do we deal with that to make it easy for people who are having such challenges to be able to walk in and, and get help? Yeah, um, it looks like um, a huge battle that is probably you could go on and on trying to deal with. Stigma is a very strong um, thing to deal with, but I believe we can begin somewhere. We can start some kind of awareness and like I said, health literacy, if, if that is part of our agenda and we are talking about educating people with regards to health and we talk about mental health as part of the package, then people will understand that the fact that um, somebody has depression doesn't mean like we stay, the person is mad. Depression can happen to anybody. Anybody at all can get uh, anxiety attacks. And uh, we begin to de demystify these conditions by educating people. I think more, more of um, education, health education is needed to kind of take that whole mystery out of the fact that it is only some cursed people. It is only some very weird looking human beings who suffer from mental challenges. Anybody at all could at a point in time develop some kind of disorder when it comes to uh, mental health. And so I think education is key at various levels, at the school level, at the workplaces. It, it can be part of our occupational health, for instance, so that people will know that you can get extremely so stressed that stress alone could push you off the edge. You can get so stressed at your workplace that you, you for, probably forget about your grooming, for instance. There are people who walk around and they have so much pressure from work, their workplace that they walk and talk by them, themselves. You are talking to yourself, probably wondering how you're going to juggle everything together to deliver at your workplace. If we make mental health issues this close to the workplace, in the schools, in various organizations, and then from the health facilities, we have people who are dedicated to this course. They decide that they will, they will go into the nearest community from their, move out of the hospital, go to the nearest community and just let people understand how anybody at all could at a point in time develop a mental disorder for which reason people need to understand the various coping mechanisms and how to seek treatment. I think the stigma will go down a bit. It's just a matter of educating people and demystifying the whole mental health Thing. We still have these weird uh, beliefs about mental health, and that needs to go away with education. Very well. Um, so we'll, we'll take the last round of, of question or discussion. And what I want to do in this round is to make it quite open so that uh, each panelist will tell us in their view what the major, of course, we discussed it in bits and pieces, what in their view is a major challenge or gap that exists in, in our quest to, to reach UHC and what opportunities or what, what we can do in, in respect of that identified gap. So maybe I'll start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Abakan Kruma. And, and before even you get to that, you think it's a realistic target that we, we've set for ourselves to achieve universal health coverage. And after that, you can add to, to, can add to it your, your, your view on the challenges. And if, if there's a challenge in your view, what's the most pressing challenge and how do we deal with that? All right, thank you very much, Selom. And I think that before I go to that, uh, I just wanted to add just uh, a little bit to the mental health issue. So yes, the ministry has started looking at mental health in terms of uh, uh, mainstreaming it and putting it as part of its plans. But I think that it is at this point where I probably would want to agree with uh, Dr. Tony uh, Danso up here when he talks about sometimes we can look at our context and evolve uh, solutions that fit our purpose. I mean, you know, we come from a society where mental health is something else, it's spiritual, is something else. So uh, I do not want to even call it mental health. Maybe we need to evolve new nomenclature for that. I probably out of my head, head saying, look, we can call them uh, uh, psychological welfare clinics or happiness clinics or something like that. And they are integrated into our main hospitals. I don't like this whole idea of having a place, okay? Just purely, yes, in Europe, they can say mental health because their situation is different. And when you talk about mental health, nobody gets offended. In Ghana, when you say, look, when I used to live in Takrade, anybody who is getting crazy, they, they, they used to have a word for them. They'll say, pardon, or a mental. 
you, you know, yeah, like to, to which this guy is mental. It means uh, uh, he's getting mad. So that's nomenclature itself. So we can evolve new nomenclature. That is one. Then the education my colleague talked about. And then we can look at restructuring the way we provide that particular service. It's got to be integrated with our hospitals, just like the way somebody will go to the urology clinic or go to the cardiovascular clinic. They can also go to the welfare clinic, okay, the psychological welfare clinic, which you can deal with all these issues so that people would be at ease and, 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 and be willing to go there. Now, back to uh, uh, UHC, okay? What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? I think that I'll talk about the opportunities first. I think that COVID has become a major opportunity, okay, to sort of recreate incentives for us to be able to move as quickly as possible. Trust me, without COVID, a lot of the things that we are thinking about right now probably wouldn't have been on the drawing board, okay? Nobody, for instance, wanted to talk about adding 1%. I remember that in 2017, when the new government came into power and they were looking at new resources into the NHIS, this 1% issue was discussed at length, but the political will to do it wasn't there. But COVID actually pushed us to do it. So for me, if I look at COVID, COVID has created a lot of incentives for us to be able to do a whole lot of things. The will is there politically. People are willing to commit to do both things. People are beginning to think out of the box. We are beginning to have new ideas in ways that we can commercialize certain things, okay? Who was thinking about vaccine production? But now we are beginning to think about it. Even if we don't get there, we started. So I think that there are opportunities for us to be able to uh, push whether we get there or not is not the thing, but even the opportunity to push. But when we talk about challenges, uh, Selim, the challenges, there are many. And the challenges are around the health system. Number one is financing. We need to be able to relook at NHIS first in terms of how do we restructure NHIS to make it sustainable in terms of getting new sources of revenue, in terms of rearranging the package that is the benefit package and uh, how we do strategic purchasing. That is one. Number two, we need to begin to look at service delivery. How do we make the delivery points more efficient? How do we ensure that it is providing quality service? And one of the things, Selom, is that, look, if you look at uh, uh, the UHC roadmap, it is counting on 100% enrollment. But the reason why the enrollment has always moved around 36 to 40% is because people are not getting the services they want. So there is no reason why they have to enroll. And, and, and some time ago, that is, I think, 20 15 or 16, we were around 40%. It was because at that point, the NHS, NHIS card was a major card for going to the bank, for registering, for voting. But now, we, in quotes, with the Baumia card, nobody needs the NHIS. So people are no longer even what registering. So we need to be able to deal with efficiency, quality of service at the production centers to make it attractive for people to want to be on the NHIS to be able to drive uh, 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 enrollment. And then we need to deal with issues of procurement and then technology, okay? Now we can reach a lot more with a lot more technology, which they began to look at that. We need to look at that. And the last thing I want to talk about, there are a lot of things, but let me talk about this and end. The issue of good. community participation community participation. If you look at our plans, all of them are supply driven. But at the end of the day, everything we do is around the patient. But oftentimes the conversation is about the supply structures and not the demand structures. We need to be able to engage communities to empower them so that they can actually drive the sort of efficiencies that we want in, in the systems. And these are things that we need to do. Okay, thank you very much. Very well. Yes, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Danswapia. Your Thank thoughts you. on the yes. challenge yes. and then what the suggestion will be for, for the way forward. Yeah, thank you, uh, Salam, for this. Yes, as I've already said, the area that I would uh, maybe want to 
um, let those who are involved in the uh, UC, uh, that is universal health coverage, to notice that we need to be able to inform the estimates and then the policies and decisions and even our projections with well, uh, that is how I call it robust evidence, evidence that has been distilled and that is so robust to inform the way forward. Other than that, most of the projections that we are making will always will betray us, not because you don't have good intentions, but we are using something that, that we are using the wrong estimate to inform what we want. Because it's like we talk something about um, statistics. It's garbage in, garbage out. If you put garbage in something, you get garbage out. You have nice graphs, nice figures, but beyond them, they, beyond the graphs and the figures, they don't make they don't make sense. In the sense that they, what it takes has not been put into it to generate them. So I'm thinking, and my suggestion is that once we've seen gaps in in uh, in in uh, the, the coverage, and then uh, COVID has opened our eyes to see that people are governments and all bodies are interested in moving forward. So I think the capacity building is the most important that we know. All, to, uh, all along, we have depended on capacity from elsewhere. We have a lot of people, so we have to now uh, bring the incentive, give the incentive that will bring people back home. And if, even if they are not coming home, with COVID has shown us that we can talk. Now I'm talking from, currently I'm talking from the UK and somebody from South Africa, we are all connected. So this is one thing that before COVID, we didn't have access to. Now we can all connect by virtual, uh, uh, maybe meetings and other things to share ideas, scientific ideas. So let us now reach out to our people who have gone somewhere. Some of them will not come back home because of the, 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 the problems that they will go through. And so we can reach out to them, bring them into the discussion table as we are doing now to, to um, help uh, maybe inform uh, whatever we have. And then the last yeah. one will be what I, I want to think say about them still about the capacity. So probably I've said it some time back. So if you want to take up because our time is running out. So thank you for that. So we have okay. to- All right, so, so I, I realize you are, you are very big on capacity building, but yeah. I, I think uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, uh, Dr. Abo, briefly, a challenge and, and what you think can be done about it, very briefly. So maybe after, after Dr. Abo's questions or um, comments, we'll now go to our Q&A box and 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 put to our panelists some questions that you have, have, have brought in or have sent to us for them to answer. Dr. Abo. Yeah, I, I think uh, Prof. Danso and uh, my colleague Abel Kankroma already kind of outlined most of the challenges that uh, I see uh, that could actually be a problem for uh, ensuring universal health coverage. Something very little I would want to add is the issue of uh, leadership and governance in this whole mix, after everything is said and done, um, after we've, I mean, we've mentioned the issue of health promotion, preventive health, capacity building, financing, at the end of the day, when all these structures are put in place and the processes are well spelled out, and we know where we are going by this roadmap that uh, Dr. Nsiansari just presented, when everything is set, the next thing that will actually ensure good outcomes and ensure that at the end of the day, we all enjoy good health care is when we have good leadership and we have good governance. And uh, in other sectors, and not just the healthcare sector, in other sectors, in the banking sector and all other sec sectors, there's evidence to show that good governance actually brings about uh, very good uh, performance and good outcomes. So let's, let's imbibe some of these business uh, principles into the healthcare sector, make sure that the processes and the structures um, are well established enough based on contextual uh, content, like Dr. Uh, Professor Danso said, with all that being done, let's have people who have the ability to influence the achievement of these goals, ability to influence, and that is leadership. And so I, I, I believe when we add that component, I wasn't too happy when um, Dr. Nsia mentioned that they are looking at the issue of leadership and management at, with the top at the top level. I, in the new 
thinking with healthcare delivery is that leadership should be a shared process. Leadership should be even at the peripheral uh, levels and not just at the top. It shouldn't be a place, uh, the training should not just be for the CEOs and the medical directors and all that. It should go to the, the very operational level. People should have the ability to influence the achievement of goals. And that is the only way that we can ensure that these goals beautifully spelled out in this roadmap will actually see the light of day. Good leadership and good Great. governance. Thank you. Very well. So, so a few questions. Uh, this one for Professor uh, uh, Abakan Kroma. It says, if we were to go for an insurance system structured as primary plus maternal care with optional add-ons for hospital care, what mechanisms could we put in place to ensure equitable financing of that secondary care? And is there a place for means testing in the equation? Looks like a very loaded question. But uh, if you can answer that in a minute, I'll be very grateful, uh, Dr. Abakar. Okay, so so I think that uh, the the questioner has already uh, answered the question because the person said, "Is there a place in means testing?" Exactly. So means testing is going to be the mechanism for ensuring equity across board. Uh, because at, when, when you have a second tier, the issue that comes in is uh, that people who have the means. That is the reason why the savings at the, the production floors. And my point is that the savings from the production floors becomes additionality in terms of resources for the state to finance those that you call the indents, the vulnerable, the poor. And how do we identify the means testing? How do you carry out means testing? We need to have reliable and credible data. We don't need the process of getting credible data. We started digitization, and this is the, the platform for us to push and to get credible data so we can means test. I mean, in salon, look, a lot of us use mobile phones. That can be a big basis for starting that. The mobile phones can tell us where people sleep. It can tell us where to work using their GPS. That can be used to even calculate some sort of spatial means testing to be able to start that sort of process. So yes, means testing has a role in this. I hope I've answered the question. Very well. Uh, so um, another one here, question from uh, Nana Kofi Kwachi. He uh, says, couldn't agree more with Professor Abo about the NHIS's overly creative focus. I think we see its consequences in the high levels of untreated, undiagnosed NCDs in Ghanaian adults. Uh, so a question here. Um, as part of efforts to expand access to preventive care, would it be useful for Ghana to consider task shifting of preventative services and management of uncomplicated NCDs to non-physician healthcare workers? And he has that uh, Benga Oge Degbe and his team at the NYU have promising findings on this potential for management of uncomplicated attention in Ghana. But that's our system, health system empower non-physician healthcare workers to make uh, to uh, to make a widespread adoption feasible. Uh, so, Dr. Abo, that's to you. Hello, Dr. Abo. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I got the question. All right, so, so, so the question is, um, as part of efforts to expand access to preventive care, would it be useful for Ghana to consider tax shifting of preventative services and management of uncomplicated, uh, non-communicable diseases for non-physician healthcare workers? Okay, so to leave the, the part of um, dealing with, like dealing with uh, these uh, preventive healthcare delivery to people, uh, to professionals who are not really, uh, he, he said non-physicians. Who are not really physician healthcare workers. Yeah, I mean, when it comes, I'm, I'm sure the professionals in the allied health areas would, would probably be able to deal with these things. A little, some kind of certification will probably definitely be needed, even if you are not a, a physician, to help people to stay healthy. I'm not sure if that is the direction the question is taking, but I believe when it comes to um, prevention of 
uh, diseases, it doesn't quite take somebody to be like a clinical professional to help others to stay healthy. I believe it's something that can be done with uh, non-physicians. People, non-physicians can actually handle that. And if, if we are bent on making people stay healthy and not get sick in the first place to come for um, healthcare, then maybe we can even in include that in the kind of insurance being provided by employ employers, for instance, so that employers focus more on keeping their employees healthier than just saying that when you get ill and you go to a facility and you bring your claims, we will pay. Maybe they can give something very little for people who would want to stay healthy. And that could be an incentive, some kind of insurance package for people who would want to take the various measures, do exercise, eat well, and then uh, stay healthy and not get sick and, and come and make claims from the workplace. So employers can actually give some kind of insurance to cover such preventive uh, services and instead of the traditional one where they wait for employees to go to the facility to seek health care and then come and make uh, claims. That, that kind of incentive would definitely work. And I, I agree that non-physicians can be helpful in dealing with these preventive health uh, care services. Very well. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting discussion we've had there. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, Dr. Patience Abo uh, of the University of Ghana, uh, Dr. Uh, Anthony Danso Apia of the School of Public Health and Director, University of Ghana, Center for Evidence Synthesis and Policy, and Dr. Godin. The car and Krumah senior lecturer in the Department of Public Administration and Health Services Management at the University of Ghana Business School. Earlier, we were joined by Dr. Anthony Insiasai, who is a presidential advisor on health, giving us Ghana's uh, uh, strides so far in the area of universal health coverage. So, this is how we, we wrap up today's discussion on this particular policy dialogue. And I want to call on uh, and so thank you so much, panelists, for, for making time to be with us. Very insightful. We, we, we hope to do this some other time again. Thank you so much. So I call on the, uh, uh, the Ghana Commission editor of the Conversation Africa, uh, Gofred Akotobuafu, to give us a vote of thanks and uh, his closing remarks. I will come back quickly and make an announcement, and then we'll call it a day. Gofred. Uh, thank you very much, Salom. And uh, like I, uh, let me just reiterate the thanks. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Anthony Danswa Pierre, uh, you've been so, so, so cooperative with us in doing this from day one. Your enthusiasm has been overwhelming. Dr. Asiwe, uh, about the same for you as well. I know the sacrifices you've had to make, particularly today, to make this happen. Uh, Dr. Godna Becker and Kuma as well, uh, a very enthusiastic contributor to academic communication, to scientific communication uh, in Ghana um, as well. And we're hoping this is the start of uh, a very vibrant engagement between the Conversation Africa and uh, the Ghanaian academic community. For the past one year, we've had uh, some significant successes, but we hope to expand on that success and engage a bit more. And a big thank you as well to all those who joined us from across the continent, uh, from South Africa, from uh, Kenya, from Nigeria, uh, from Tanzania, uh, everywhere you joined us on the continent. Thank you very much, and you feel free to engage with us. A big thank you to all my colleagues as well who made this happen to Adi Juan Soyenka, uh, the original editor to Yusifo, uh, to Fungwa Nyamukachi, to Candice Bailey, to Alex Story, uh, to Jabulani Sikakane, the editor, and also our founding editor, Caroline Saudi, who is always hiding there and supporting us uh, from the back. So thank you very much uh, for spending time with us. And uh, we'll be in touch and uh, we'll do our best to make sure that uh, we spread the word of uh, this conversation that we've had today. Thank you very much. All right. So thank you so much, Gofred. So I must say uh, that we are happy to, to, to have you with us. And so let this not be the end of it. Uh, I want you to uh, visit the Conversation Africa uh, for more content from academics on the continent discussing their research, et cetera. And the website is uh, www.theconversation.com. Dot com, the conversation.com, www.com, the conversation.com. And you can also sign up for uh, the Conversation Africa's newsletter. So thank you so much for making time to be with us. My name is Salom Adun, and it's been a pleasure uh, moderating this. Thank you so, so, so much for having you. Have a good day. <laughs>